Staff, County Attorney Bill Montgomery joining me to share his take on why people should vote no on Prop 205. Now, earlier today, I spoke with Reverend Alexander Sharp, who is for Prop 205. He's part of the executive, or he's the executive director for the Clergy for a New Drug Policy. And he spoke with our viewers and explained why he thinks people should vote for 205. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this for you. And okay. then we will give you an opportunity to respond, and then you'll share your take as to why voters out there in Arizona should vote no on this proposition to legalize marijuana. Sounds good. All right, so let's go ahead and play this for you guys now. There are several reasons, and they all speak to uh, matters of faith. The first is simply justice. Uh, our marijuana laws, and indeed the whole failed war on drugs, mm -hmm. comes down so heavily. Uh, on minority groups, right. and that's uh, that's a disproportionate impact in a way that ruins lives generally, uh, but especially ruins lives of, pe of, of poor people. Right. Uh, so that's the first reason. Second is what I boil down to simple honesty. We've got a hodgepodge of drug laws. Some drugs are uh, legal, like alcohol, right. uh, marijuana is illegal. Uh, uh, Vicodin and, and Oxycontin, painkillers, prescription, prescription drugs are legal. Uh, marijuana is not. How do kids sniff out, sniff out hypocrisy. They know what's going on if we're not talking to them straight. So how can we be in any way moral leaders if we're not even honest about the way we're categorizing drugs and how we ourselves, uh, often people that use alcohol, uh, are, are, are using drugs. So simple honesty is a basis for good educational programs so that uh, we can tell people what drugs are all about. You can't do that if you're not even uh, putting drugs on a, on a honest playing field. Uh, the third thing is, is deeply for me a matter of faith, and that is that the Jesus that I know didn't go out and say, let's arrest people uh, for uh, personal behavior that, that didn't hurt others. Uh, he reached out to the heart. He reached out through persuasion and a sense of mercy and compassion and forgiveness. The, mar the marijuana laws, and again, the drug war more broadly, and don't ever forget the fact that our marijuana laws fuel the, drug, the failed war on drugs. Uh, uh, hurt people's lives because they punish people. The motto of my organization is healing, not punishment, and that's what our faith calls upon us to do. The last thing is simply a matter of safety, especially for our youth. This is an argument that's been used so many times, I hope people are listening to it. You get your drugs in back alleys, you're getting them from people that are going to try to steer you to harder drugs, and you're getting stuff that you don't even know the, the quality of. It's often contaminated. So with taxing and regulate, you'll have stuff out there uh, you got to be very cautious about how you use it. You don't want our young people using it. Uh, but at least you've got something that's regulated. I don't like the term legalization. I like tax and regulate because it means you've got a handle on what our drugs are about, mm -hmm. but not just uh, sort of in another world where it's prohibited, but they have them and everybody knows they're getting them. Right. This is honesty and clarity and control. So are you of the belief that if people want it, they're going to find a way to get it? Oh, absolutely. It's I mean, that, that's a platitude about this. I mean, the, the numbers are 80% of uh, 12th graders can get marijuana in a matter of seconds. Wow. Wow. And so just for the viewers who may not know, you're the executive director for the clergy for a new drug policy. That's Tell me about this organization because I think most people would assume that people who are deeply in tune with religion, religious figures, would want to vote against anything drug related. You know, that's because the the extreme religious right, and I don't know if extreme is the right word for Franklin Graham, but certainly evangelicals, and there's many of the things we can respect and have in common, but evangelicals have uh, come out against this uh, on what I think is an out based on an outdated notion of sin, which says that you're going to be punished if you don't walk the straight and narrow in this world, and they equate that with uh, not using drugs and not doing any other things that might be seen quite as sinful uh, uh, in order to get into the next world of salvation. That's right. how they read a first century interpretation of the Bible. We live in the 21st century now, uh, and but the fact that evangelical Christians create a sense of what Christianity is uh, leads to many people do exactly what you ask. There's a, a, a sense of Christianity that doesn't necessarily agree uh, that all drug use is sinful and that the best way to, to deal with drug use is to punish and prohibit it. Right, and just because it is regulated doesn't mean that you have to actually use it. Absolutely. One of the th mantras of, th there are law enforcement people that are uh, supporting Prop 205. There, there is a national physicians group that is supporting it, uh, and of course clergy are. So we put on forums called Cops, Docs, and Clergy uh, against the drug war and speaking with, with one voice. Uh, 
Uh, and, and their mantra is you don't have to uh, approve of marijuana use in order to support Proposition 205. Mm -hmm. And how did your group get together? How was this formed? I, I started with the notion that people in our society need a second chance. Uh, they don't get it. If you've got anything on your record, you're not going to be able to get back on a your A job, feet. an apartment, so anything. This lets you believe in progress. I went down to Springfield, our state capital, began to try to help some of those folks, and I realized so many people were in prison who shouldn't be there because of low-level drug possession. You couldn't even talk to legislators about that 10 years ago. Now they have a commission in Illinois to reduce prison population by 25 percent uh, in the next 10 years, meaning the language has changed. But I got into it to give people a second chance and realized our drug laws put pe in people in that situation who should be nowhere near that level of problem in their lives. Mm -hmm. So for viewers out there that are people of faith that are morally conflicted yes. regarding Prop 205 and their own beliefs, what do you want to say to them? I want to say that their concerns are, rule, are, are real. Uh, this is a complex question, uh, but that regulation and education is the way to resolve that anguish that people have because that's going to lead to the better result. Regulation, control, and then persuasive educational programs. Uh, and I, I do want to add that 80 percent of the money uh, that will be generated through Prop 205 will go to education programs, and that's a very important thing. There's a false ad, I think, on television right now that says uh, uh, one, one mayor in, in Colorado says, well, we didn't get any of that money. $169 million has been generated through tax revenue in Colorado, a major portion of which has gone to education. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what happened to Denver, but uh, other places are getting it. So would you say that Colorado is a perfect example of the success of regulating marijuana? I, I, I think it's premature to say that. I don't like people who cherry pick data. I will say that Governor Hickenlooper, who opposed this at the time, says, you know, Things seem to be working out. It's mm -hmm. not the fears that I was worried about haven't come true. Uh, use of marijuana by youth is down, uh, uh, and uh, the revenue has materialized. So there, there are very good signs coming out of Colorado. I think mm -hmm. we have to wait longer, but the signs are good. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the main reasons your organization addresses this issue is because there are so many people that are in prison for minor offenses related that's, to That's marijuana. how we got started. That's how we got started. Uh, the, uh, and that's a whole other discussion, that's the a whole, problem yeah. with our Yeah, I mean, in marijuana, most people don't go to prison. Mm -hmm. uh, but even an arrest on your record can, can really mess up your life. Here's what the drug warriors don't get. They don't realize the, the, the damage they're doing to people in the name of trying to do the right thing. There's a wonderful Presbyterian report that's come out that I'm trying to publicize. Same uh, logo as my organization, Healing Before Punishment. Uh, and they point out that we're using the wrong weapons to right the, fight the wrong thing. Uh, and that is exactly the wrong weapon. Locking people up uh, for minor offenses uh, mm -hmm. simply destroys lives. There's a wonderful phrase that says, poverty is violence in slow motion. Well, putting people in jail or even just arresting them is violence in slow motion. That's what the drug warriors forget. In the name of trying to do something that I'm sure many of them believe in, um, they're doing a whole bunch of things that I don't even understand. Okay, so if you have one final thought to leave all our viewers with regarding Prop 205, what would that be? Uh, that I, th I go back to the justice argument because I think that's what people of faith can understand most clearly and are most uh, easily, uh, and e easily able to respond to and eager to respond to. All right, well, Reverend Alexander Sharp, thank you so much My for pleasure. joining us here on News Now. You guys can watch this clip in full on our YouTube channel. We will clip it so you guys can rewatch it a little bit later on. Thanks so much. Okay, guys, so that was the full interview with Reverend Alexander Sharp. He was the executive director for Clergy for a New Drug Policy, actually based in Illinois and he happened to be around to speak with us regarding his position. As I mentioned earlier today, County Attorney Phil Montgomery joins us to discuss why people should vote no on Prop 205. Hi. Wow. <laughs> so you just heard from the Reverend, and I know some people tuning in earlier were just surprised to hear from a religious figure speaking so 
I guess you could say positively about the legalization of drugs. Now, I know that you are very much against Prop 205. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm against it from a public safety perspective as well as from a responsible government perspective. Mm -hmm. And if you have the time to wade through the roughly 20 pages of eight-point font that creates wholesale new areas of law for Arizona, uh, you will come across one section after another that will justify a no vote, even if from a principled perspective you might agree with the principles that were discussed uh, by Reverend Sharp. Uh, but first and foremost, I think people need to understand that this group, uh, Clergy for New Drug Policy, this is one other George Soros front organization. Their partners include the Marijuana Policy Project that is sponsoring this current initiative, as well as the Drug Policy Alliance, which is another George Soros funded organization, and Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, which was also begun with George Soros funding. So I, I think this is, uh, th this is another front group by George Soros pushing a particular idea that Arizona voters should reject. Now, what are some other points that he raised that need to be rebutted? Well, first is this false mantra of the war on drugs and that the war on drugs is responsible for everything that ails us in society. First off, uh, I'm a Gulf War veteran. I know what war looks like. This is not a war. This has been a multi-decade effort at having a consistent national drug policy that has proven successful. The most recent national survey on drug use and health of America uh, indicates that 90% of Americans do not use drugs. I mean, if we could get 90% of Americans to agree to not do or do anything <laughs> in any other area, we would say that's successful. And yet, I don't think we should give up on the 10% of Americans who do have issues with addiction, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's alcohol or marijuana or cocaine or methamphetamine, prescription LSD. Prescription drugs, e too. Right, even prescription drugs. And the other thing to keep in mind is, um, and I appreciated uh, Reverend Sharp's call for us to be honest, so let's be honest. Six years ago, we were told that if we created a medical marijuana system in Arizona, we'd be able to help those with marijuana's medicine. And now, because dispensary owners have made so much money off of that, they've agreed to go into business with the Marijuana Policy Project to now create a recreational market that would expand the number of available users and allow these individuals, the current dispensary owners, to make millions of dollars. The chairman of this proposition owns two dispensaries and has a cultivation site. He's going to make money hand over fist and we're going to pay for it. And when I say pay for it, we'll pay for it in terms of public safety consequences. There's a specific provision within the initiative that states the state may impose no penalty for an action taken while under the influence of marijuana based solely upon the presence of metabolites in somebody's blood. Now, the lawyers who wrote this initiative missed the Supreme Court opinion two years ago that says you can't charge somebody with DUI unless they have active impairing metabolites in their system. And those only last from 3 to 12 hours. So we're not talking about our laws even allowing someone to be charged 30 days after use. So this section now is overly broad, addresses a problem we don't have, but creates a new one for law enforcement. Let me give an example. Currently, if there's a collision in which someone's hurt or killed and the impaired driver, who usually is the one that survives, is unconscious, so they make no statements to law enforcement, mm -hmm. they don't do the field sobriety tests, they don't do a drug recognition evaluation, our ability to charge and prove impairment and therefore reckless conduct in causing the death of another is based on those blood results. But this initiative gives virtual immunity to an impaired marijuana driver that doesn't exist for alcohol or any other drug. Mm -hmm. The other things to keep in mind, too, is that this creates a system of regulation greater than anything we have for any other substance in Arizona. The Department of Marijuana is given authority to investigate not just licensees like the Department of Liquor, but also anyone in Arizona who transfers marijuana for anything of value. Now, that degree of regulatory enforcement is going to swallow up the dollars required to carry out that regulatory system. So when you pay for the regulatory overhead of the Department of Marijuana, you pay for the regulatory overhead for the Department of Revenue that's supposed to go out now and ensure that cash-only businesses are paying their taxes, because mm -hmm. that'll happen. Uh, then you've got to pay back the marijuana fund because this proposition takes money out of the medical marijuana fund. And so they got to pay that back. So you're saying this is going to cost taxpayers here in Arizona a lot of money? Oh, it will. Yeah. It will. By the time you work your way down to a pittance that could go to schools, even under best of circumstances, it's not enough money to buy one textbook for a child for the year. So uh, I say, you know, keep that change because the societal cost that we're going to have to pay will be a net loss 
by more money out of the general fund that we'll have to spend to cover uh, the impaired drivers, more kids going to emergency rooms, which they saw in Colorado, mm -hmm. as well as more people who are going to be addicted and need treatment services. You know, that's one of the other things that I don't think Reverend Sharp knew about Arizona. We've been a treatment first state for 20 years, going back to 1996. Your first two drug possession or use offenses, you can't go to prison in Arizona. We're mandated to provide substance abuse treatment, and we do. And over the course of that treatment, 75% of people successfully go on to avoid contact with the criminal justice system. So let's system. say hypothetical situation, right? Hypothetical situation, I'm driving and I'm in possession of marijuana and I get pulled over. What happens to me? First offense. Sure, first offense, and it's a usable amount. You know, it's not just there's a leaf in the car or one seat. Mm -hmm. It's a usable amount. Sure. Uh, what can happen if you have no criminal history mm -hmm. is we're going to give you a chance to go through a diversion program to help address substance abuse issues. And if you successfully complete it, and mind you, you don't have a criminal history, right. we're not going to file a criminal charge so against you. I don't get arrested in that moment. I uh, do get arrested. It's a possibility that if, if you know, a police officer were to find you know, just a usable amount, you could be cited. Okay. It's not a guarantee that you get arrested. Mm -hmm. Everything else that's part of that stop would be taken into account right. by the police officer. So Driving recklessly or it's just a headlight out. Uh, yeah, it could yeah. be a headlight out, uh, but then the officer didn't stop you because you were in possession of marijuana. Right. He didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so these arrests mm -hmm. that occur within Arizona for possession of marijuana, it starts with something else. Mm -hmm. And it's only as a result of further investigation that that might even come into play. But if you successfully complete that treatment program, you, you won't be charged. And even if you might have a criminal history and we charge you to begin with, if you successfully complete the program, we dismiss the case with prejudice. So you never have that felony conviction on your record. And the reality, too, is is that it really takes about the fourth or fifth case where that felony charge is going to stick. Mm -hmm. uh, that first time that we go to prosecute, we typically designated a misdemeanor up front so that, again, we can focus on getting people help. It's when we start to see possession of marijuana offenses occur in concert with other property offenses mm -hmm. that we now start to focus then on public safety and less on the drug treatment because now we have the problem of drug motivated crime and that's where our focus has to go. Well, people uh, smuggling in drugs, drug dealers, that sort of crime? Uh, we see that too. In fact, that's the majority of offenders in prison right, right now who go to prison for possession of marijuana. They've typically pled down from drug trafficking or possession for sale. In Arizona, we're the main thoroughfare for drug smuggling in the United States. Right. And legalizing marijuana is not going to change that. I mean, in Colorado, uh, they've seen cartel operations expand. They've had, over the last couple of years, federal, state, and local law enforcement investigations that have resulted in the arrests of nationals from Cuba, China, Colombia, Laos, Mexico, and Vietnam. Uh, we didn't see that before they legalized marijuana there. And the other important point to make is that in Arizona we have the Voter Protection Act. So we can't learn from our mistakes and correct them like they've been trying to do in Colorado. They've had over 80 pieces of legislation go through that legislature trying to fine tune the system they set up. We won't be able to do it once. All we can do is take these issues that I've shared uh, with folks this afternoon and make them worse mm -hmm. because of the degree of voter protection that applies to these statutes. Well, what about the medical benefits? Um, medical marijuana was legalized here a few years ago. What's your take on that? If you had it your way, would you allow medical marijuana to be legal? I think what we could do in Arizona, similar to what we've seen in other states, where we can modify that program to ensure that it hasn't become a de facto recreational program, which 205 does nothing with medical marijuana. Right. It's not going to affect it at all. So these commercials we've seen with a retired pro football player who says he's in pain and wanted to get off his opioids, he would qualify for medical marijuana. The veteran who uh, declares that uh, he suffers from PTSD and or uh, problems with opioids, mm -hmm would qualify for medical marijuana. 205 doesn't touch that at all. But what I would uh, suggest we do so that we aren't ignoring federal law is we could pass a law in the state of Arizona that said if you're complying with federally approved trials or federally approved applications of marijuana and derivatives, then you wouldn't be subject to state prosecution. It's similar to what we have with medical marijuana now, but it would be more tied to uh, those programs that are actually going through the rigorous process of making sure that people are getting medicine that helps a particular condition with a particular dose and a particular frequency, like we treat all other medicine. Would you say that in the current state, medical marijuana is being abused, or people are getting prescriptions that may not need it? Well, it, 
And the, the term that's used under the Medical Marijuana Act is a recommendation, and we know that that's true. When you've got uh, the top 10 prescribers or recommenders for marijuana being responsible for over 50% of the individuals who qualify, that's a heads up that we have a problem. When you look at the biggest demographic, uh, age-wise, is 18 to 40, male, and it's chronic pain, um, that's a problem. That's like uh, uh, almost 50% of the population and over 70% of the conditions are chronic pain. Uh, it's about 5% actually have the conditions that when medical marijuana was on our ballot, the proposers for that initiative said, this is who it's supposed to help, 5%. And these same folks are now back six years later telling us, well, it's not really medicine, it can use, be used by anybody. That's the confusing message we're sending to youth where we told them that drug use for the last two decades or three decades plus is not good for you, it will harm your development, it will impact your future. And then we tell them, well, this particular drug that in its potency today, this isn't the marijuana of yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, before it was three to 5% THC. Today, it averages 18% in retail stores in Denver. It can be as much as 36% mm. in just the smoked form. The concentrated form can be in excess of 90% THC, and that's what they're using to make edibles. Um, but right. that being used by teens today will interfere with their brain development mm -hmm. and can interfere with the actual physical construct of the brain. Well, what about the argument that people make that marijuana relative to other drugs, not as harmful, not addictive compared to, you know, a big problem we have here in Arizona like heroin? Right. And any drug is harmful in and of itself and how it impacts the human body and its addictive components one drug relative to another doesn't really tell the story. If you're addicted to heroin and you're not a user of alcohol, you could say, well, alcohol in this case is relatively safer than heroin. Uh, but those relative comparisons pale in comparison to the harm that's done to any individual with drug use in and of itself. Um, I would say that the marijuana that is being sold today is addictive. Uh, it does carry use disorders. In fact, current active users of marijuana have a use disorder rate of one out of three. And nowhere near that is the use disorder rate for, for abusers of alcohol right now. The number one substance people are seeking treatment for in Colorado is marijuana. It's, it's displaced alcohol. In that sense, people there are now treating marijuana like alcohol. But Colorado still leads the nation in usage rates for marijuana, opioids, alcohol, and cocaine. Legalizing marijuana didn't get rid of those other substances or abuse of those other substances. It didn't replace it. Now we see the additive effect, and that's, that increases the risk for the community and the costs of addiction and the risks to teens and other youth who may fall into that same addiction trap. Now, I know I brought this question up with the, the reverence. So I want to ask you that same question. What about the argument that, you know, whether it's legal or not, kids are going to get their hands on it if they want it? Well, today, usage rates for marijuana among teens in Arizona is much less than usage rates for alcohol and tobacco, both legal regulated substances. When you tell people something is legal and you increase its availability, you see use increase. And we know from tobacco and alcohol that no matter how much we regulate it, you can't keep it out of the hands of youth. At least by keeping it illegal and treating it as the drug that it is, we send a consistent message. I mean, the Reverend wanted to talk about honesty. Let's be honest. Let's not confuse the message that we're sending to kids. Drugs are harmful to them. Keeping it illegal keeps the use rates among teens lower than the legal regulated substances. And in this initiative, uh, you know, we want to see about how are we going to treat availability for youth. If a teen uses a fake ID to buy marijuana under this initiative, it's treated as a petty offense. Mm -hmm. If it's alcohol, it's a criminal misdemeanor. If a teen gets someone to buy marijuana for them under this initiative, it's a petty offense. If they were to do it with alcohol, it'd be a criminal misdemeanor. So what kind of message are we really sending? I would challenge the Reverend to actually read this initiative because I don't think he did it. I would challenge the Reverend to actually look at how we treat substance abuse in Arizona because I don't think he's aware of it. And yet again, what we've got is someone who's pushing a legalize at any cro uh, cost message, who's part of a George Soros-backed organization, pushing a, a theory and pushing a narrative that's not true for Arizona. Okay. Mr. Montgomery, final thoughts for viewers out there who are still undecided, because right now latest polls show that uh, more people are supporting yes on 205 than no on 205. We are just a couple of weeks away from the election. What do you want to tell those people at home who are undecided or are maybe planning to vote yes? 
Well, I would say that if your overall idea is that we shouldn't uh, have criminalized drug use in the United States, that's fine because we're being asked in Arizona to sit as a super legislature exercising our right under the Constitution to pass laws. So look at this like you would as a legislator and see, does this idea and how it gets implemented match your vision of what a legalized marijuana regime would look like? Because for everybody who's actually read through this initiative, my libertarian friends, conservatives who think that we should legalize, they don't like how this is set up. This lines the pockets of dispensary owners, gives them a captive market, creates regulatory regimes for the marijuana industry that don't exist for any other, minimizes penalties for youth access, creates public safety harms. So if the idea was simply to decriminalize, that could have been done in one paragraph, and instead we've got 19 more pages. This creates a level of government bureaucracy we don't see with anything else. We'd say vote no on this, and let's come back and talk about legalization later. We'll have more time to see what's going on in Colorado, what works, what doesn't work, and we can have that conversation later. But for this election, for this initiative, for these ideas, this isn't good for Arizona, and people should vote no on Proposition 205. Thank you so much. Bill Montgomery, guys, Maricopa County Attorney, telling you why you should not vote on Prop 205.